Hello and welcome to Taskmaster Talks with Kevin Sullivan. I am your host, JP John Paz. Of course, with me, the star of the show, the former WCW and ECW World Tag Team Champion, the man behind the NWO, the man behind the 83 Weeks of Dominance. He's one of the greatest minds and bookers ever in the history of the business, the Games Master, the Taskmaster, the devil himself, Mr. Kevin Sullivan. Kevin, how are you doing today, sir? I'm doing wonderful, JP. How are you, my man? Doing good. Doing good. Can't complain. Probably doing a lot better than Vince McMahon is doing right about now. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's amazing to me. It doesn't surprise me, but it's amazing. It took something like this catastrophic event to get Vince out of the wrestling business. As you and I were talking about before the show, they've been in the wrestling business since the 1920s with uh, the grandfather, right? Uh, Jess McMahon, yep. Jess McMahon. Think about that. Yeah, over 100 years. It's amazing to me. And people can criticize or whatever they want to do. If he wasn't Vince McMahon and didn't create what he did... I don't think wrestling would be anywhere near as hot. And it might have been uh, fold the tent up and go home. I think he was a genius to keep it running for so long. They say he killed the territories, but they were kind of dying off on their own before he came and made WWF an international, global, you know, dominated company. Okay, I'm going to bring something up that I've never heard anybody bring up, okay? Never, ever. <clears throat> Do you know in the late 50s or early 60s, Jim Crockett backed Argentina Rocca. Jim Crockett Sr. backed him, Argentina Rocca. And a group that had some money, and it was uh, championship wrestling with Argentina Rocker, I believe. And they ran opposition against Vince. Is, that's never been brought up, but isn't it funny that Crockett's and McMahon's have been feuding for this long, for that long, and it end up them feud the last two feud really right? Yeah, big one. Did you know that about the opposition? No, so it was Crockett Sr. and Vince Sr. refuting. Yeah, because Vince uh, Crockett Sr. went up to New York City, and I think it was over <clears throat> a territorial dispute, meaning I think McMahon or Crockett was feuding over Baltimore. Because basically, you know, if you look at the territorial lines... Baltimore was still a southern state. You know, it's south of Mason-Dixon line, which a lot of people don't know. So, uh, yeah. So, I mean, they've been feuding forever. But that used to happen all the time. Did Vince Jr. kill the territories, or was it going to happen anyway? Well, <clears throat> some of the territories were ran by very smart guys. But they had got to the point, you know how I always say don't follow with the patterns? These guys like Roy Shires ran a great territory in San Francisco. Absolutely great. I mean, I was making uh, the Cow Palace alone uh, very, very well. But he started to get lazy and fall into patterns. You know, the three series of matches, you know, the disqualification, the stopping for blood, then the cage. And I think Vince came in with a fresh take on it. Uh, up until then, most promoters wanted to send the fans home pissed. Heat. McMahon went the other way. I don't think like Kansas City, Kansas could have made it because 
They used to shoot. Think about this, JP. They were so cheap about sending the tapes out. <clears throat> they were on a regional network in Kansas City that covered their whole territory. And you saw the matches live on Thursday night. But they bicycled the tapes and they'd be six weeks behind by the time they got to the last town, six, eight weeks. But you saw the angle play out already in Kansas City. They didn't they didn't put any effort into it. And Vince came in with all these different ideas. I'm not gonna say he was absolutely right on them, but it might have fo folded up with these other guys and closed the tents. Now, Eddie would have survived. I always thought that if Eddie and Vince had Jr. had gotten together with Barnett, that would have been a whole different ball game too. Eddie would have kept them on the track of uh, a little bit more serious. And I think Vince could have talked Eddie into a little bit more sports entertainment. With that, it's funny because the cable TV era, if you will, like Vince was on with the cable. Vince was on with the pay-per-view. The, all the other guys behind him, you know what I mean? He, he had the vision already to, to do that stuff. And it seemed like most of the territory guys, most of the promoters were behind him. Yeah. And uh, so basically what you're saying, he, they were behind him catching up to him, right? That's what you meant? By, by, yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah. I mean, they didn't have, you know, <clears throat> there is something about coming out of New York. You know, it's a pulse of the media market in the United States. So I think as he was being a commentator, Vince Jr., I think he met a lot of people that were coming up at the same time like him in the entertainment business. And they all had fresh ideas and they saw what it could be, and then Hogan came along at the right time, the right place, and uh, it was pretty ingenious how he did it. Can't believe he retired. I mean, we never thought we'd see the day. It's absolutely shocking. It's about, I think it was $14.6 million of money and payments and stuff, so he kind of was forced into retiring. So. I mean, did that news shock you and floor you? Because I know I never thought I'd see the day where he'd be retired. I never thought he'd retire. I'm like you. I thought he would go on forever. And uh, it struck me that it took this to retire him. Because when it hit me about how he's retiring, I said it had to be something like this. He wasn't going to walk off in the sunset. I mean... We've heard stories about how hard he works and he's never had a vacation and all this. I mean, in a way, and I know this people are going to say, oh, boo. In a way, I feel that he was, he was, what is, I want to be very careful what I say. He was caught in his own time warp. Do you know what I mean? I think he was caught in his own time warp. I'm not uh, condoning what he did, but what I'm saying is uh, it, it was a different game back then. It was completely male-dominated. Uh, it, it was, you know, I, I saw a thing. They were talking about doing... Uh, the office back again. Did you see that where they talk about starting it? No, mm -mm, didn't see that. And, and then Steve Carroll said he couldn't get by the first 30 seconds of the show. <laughs> and it was, you know, I, I was still watching now that I'm here in Florida for a few, for a little time. Then I, I start laughing and he's completely right. You couldn't do it. It's a different world. And uh, I don't think he would have step down hella high water if it wasn't for this woke age. 
to me, he's acting like it's a private company when it's a public company because technically all the payments he was making from his own money was making the company worth more. But you could look at the expenses like, what the hell is this expense? Why is your money getting thrown in here? Like, what is that for? Who's it going to? Why is Vince paying it himself? You can't do that in a public company. So he was treating it like it was his own private company. JP, has that been confirmed 100% that it was out of the company money? So it was confirmed it was his money that he was paying into the WB money, and it was basically um, being paid out through WB, but it was from his own money. So in essence, when you put money into something and it goes to something else, where does that money originate from? Like, And if it's coming from Vince himself, that means the company is throwing in more money into the pile that doesn't actually come from the company. It's like coming from Vince and he's throwing it in. So technically, if you look at that it, that doesn't he's make sense to me. It's Does weird. That make it, sense to you? It's very confusing. And, and I was reading somebody online that they were trying to explain it. Very, very confusing. But but to me, it, it's he's putting money into the company and not giving a reason of where it's coming from or, or what it is or who's, who's it going to. That's the way I kind of got it, the gist of it. Okay. Okay. So, uh, do you think he'll be tried criminally? They said the uh, SEC and the federal government is looking into it. So, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how it goes. I don't know what they do, but um, I guess they're going to look into whatever they can do about it. Yeah, I mean, uh, if it was his own money, I feel like can they do anything? But if it's not his own money, that's fraud, embezzlement. That's, you know, that's, uh, who was the guy that had the Ponzi scheme in New oh, York? Oh, Bernie Madoff. Yeah. That's right off of his playbook, it sounds like, you know. So this is going to be interesting. And I wonder how it will affect wrestling. It seems right now there's been like a little surge in it. Do you think? Yeah, the ratings were up for Raw and SmackDown, and the stock went up a little bit. Amazing. Amazing. Just to get people's uh, name in the paper can drive ratings. She just goes to show you how strong their company is and what was and is and every other thing. But we talked earlier. Maybe this is the time they're going to do the big sale. Yeah, what do you think about that? I was reading that they could be worth up to $6 billion if they were to sell today. I mean, that's a huge – I mean, we're talking like huge chunk of change. UFC, I think, sold for $4 billion or $5 billion, So it's worth more than UFC, according to some. Uh, I, I'm not sure if it's worth more than WWE. Do you? That's what they're saying. They could get more for it. I don't know. Maybe, maybe because of the TV deals. I'm not sure. I mean, I'm saying, I guess I misunderstood you. I'm saying that, yeah, I think you're right. I think that WWE is uh, more valuable than the UFC. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I think it is. Yeah. 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 So, uh, and overseas, I don't think what Vince did is going to affect him as much as it does in the United States. Would you think that they would be selling, let's say, $6 billion? Like, do you think they'd be selling to NBC, to Disney? Who do you think that he would sell to? I, I mean, I, uh, this is like picking something out of the hat. I just think it'd have to be Disney. And they put in the parks as a, a ride or a something. You know what I mean? An attraction. I mean, how are you getting your money back if I'm Disney? I guess, I guess the buying, it'd be like buying the NFL. I thought about that. What if somebody bought the NFL? Who would buy the NFL? Who would be strong enough from the outside to actually run that company? That's the question. So you'd probably have to keep Triple H and Stephanie like they did with UFC. You'd have to keep like you know Dana White on yeah. board to, to run the thing. Yeah. 
So it would be uh, interesting if they did a park, though. I mean, I would look like the Hulk Hogan coaster or something. I mean, that'd be pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. Hall I of Fame, see, maybe physical Hall of Fame. I could see that. Yeah. I could see that. Uh, do you think? So, go ahead. Do you, I was going to say, do you think it's possible Vince is still running things? Because he's technically still the owner of the company. He still controls 80% of the board. I think it's 38% ownership, and I think the next person has considerably lower than him. So is it possible he's still running things? He's still the owner, technically. I wouldn't put anything past him. He's a very smart businessman. And uh, where he grew up, he grew up in a hotbed of, I said it, of the wrestling media world, and not just the wrestling media world, the world of entertainment that he picked up friends along the way, and I don't know who else can fill his shoes. When was the first time you ever met Vince? Uh, the first time I went up to do their TVs. Very nice, very nice guy, you know. Uh, big, you know, back in the day, the uh, shoulder pads and the sport coach. You remember that? Or oh, yeah. Do you oh, well, yeah, I remember. Everybody had them. Girls had them, guys. Had them. He looked like he was as wide as a barn door. Very nice, very approachable. Uh, he had his... Even then, he was, you could see in his eye that he was hungry for it. And he really wanted to learn. Did you like him as much as, like, let's say Vince Sr., for instance? Because I know Eddie and Vince Sr. were close. Were you, like, close with Vince at all? Did you like him as much as Vince Sr., or was Vince Sr. more your, your guy? Well, uh, he was the head of the company. Uh, Vince Sr. was a real gentleman. I mean, he had, he went out of his way. There were times <clears throat> when uh, they had two parts of the territory to run. Got, most guys either lived in New Jersey or in the Boston area, right? So if I was going to be on a, a show that was in New Jersey, uh, Pennsylvania area, and it was the same sh kind of show running in in the Boston area, I go to Vince Senior and say, "Hey, uh, the payoff isn't going to be much different than me if I'm, unless you're putting the guy over on me, and I uh, because you're getting ready for Bruno, and I don't see, think you're gonna, uh, could you switch it for me?" And he, would, "Oh yeah, Kevin, I'm a snake, no problem." Very, very accommodating man. Uh, I had the death of the family, and I think I've said this before, I missed three shows, big shows. I got there that night after the three, four days I was gone, and uh, the agent came up to me and said, hey, this is for you. It was for the three shows, and very good payoff, probably better than I would have gotten. He was a very, very kind guy. You never worked for Vince Jr., though, huh? No, no, no. Ever any chance of it? Like, how come never yeah, worked for it? Yeah. Uh, when I had just opened the gym, I got a call from Ace and Stephanie. And they asked me to come up. And I said, no, I'm not going to come up. I said, uh, you got a show in Fort Lauderdale soon. Maybe I can meet you there. And that's what I did. I met them. And they were very cordial, very kind, very nice. But what happened was I just opened the gym. I had over a million three in the gym. And... Uh, I, it was originally that I was just going to go up for TVs. And then every time we were on the phone on another meeting, it went from that to you come up for TV and then you'll stay till 
we'll get you out Wednesday, and then Wednesday turn to Thursday. And then on uh, the pay-per-views, you'd have to go in and a day early, you know, if it was on Sunday back then, you'd have to go on Saturday. So I had just invested a lot of money in this business, and I couldn't afford for that to go under. And uh, we uh, we just just didn't agree to the time and the date, so it was no big deal. And uh, we ended up you know, parting ways, and it was okay with me. So Stephanie now is co CEO with Nick Khan which is, you know, interesting. They put Triple H as the head of creative. What do you think about that? I mean, that's a big role. He's doing talent relations and he's head of creative. You know, I don't know him that well. I was just around me when he was uh, terrorizing. But all I hear about him is how much he loves the business. I think he did a great job on NXT, don't you think? Yeah, but he still lost in the ratings to AEW. So, I know, thin line. Like, he did a good job, but he still lost. Yeah, but do you think he would have lost if he was given free reigns? That, don't you think Vince was interfering at that time? He wasn't giving him, I don't know, like the Ted WB talent. You know what I mean? If I was him, I would have been like, hey, can I borrow... I don't know, whoever, you know, Roman Reigns for the week or I don't know, somebody to kind of just give him a little bit of a kick in the ass as far as getting some bigger names on the show. Right. And maybe that was a little bit of an ego on Vince's part. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, you're going to give a guy your talent that's going to bump you. You know, it's a very uh, crazy atmosphere up there. You know what I'm getting at? You really never know what the true story is. Oh, yeah. There is so much yeah. so much going on up there. You, like, you always hear stories people don't like working there, the stress, the stuff. So that's why I'm kind of curious with Triple H. He had a heart attack you know, not that long ago. Like, Can he handle the stress of the job? Yeah, and didn't he have a heart problem from childhood? Didn't they say that or was by Gotcha. Yeah, they said it was genetic. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And I've come to believe, and I may be just talking out of school here, that steroids contribute to a lot of problems. And I'm not claiming they took them, but if you've ever taken them or if you ever trained, you know what it looks like. Yeah. It's, you know, uh, it's a real competitive age, uh, age back when they were doing it. Everybody was doing it. And uh, I think that a lot of guys died or had health problems because of that. And, hey, I mean, who's to say he did or didn't do it? But he looked like, body-wise, he looked like oh. he was, uh, you know, a steroid guy. There's no doubt about it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he looked fabulous. I mean, he. And uh, I've heard, you know, you hear some stuff about him, but most of the stuff I hear about him is that he trains very, very hard. And if he had had the uh, childhood, maybe rheumatic fever or scholar fever or something, it does attack your heart, you know what I mean? So thank God he uh, caught it in time. With WB, so you're guessing maybe a year from now or so, like you're guessing they might sell. That that would be your your guess. I think they would sell as quick as possible. I think before this thing happened, to Vince, they were preparing themselves to sell. Don't you? I mean, it looked that way to me. They were cleaning the books. Uh, cutting guys that were draws, you know what I mean? Yep. Uh, Braun Strohem, I mean, I thought he had a potential, and then they cut him. Uh, the Fiend, they cut him. 
they cut in some of the girls that were going to drive. I mean, they're bringing the numbers down to make it as palatable to a person wanting to buy it as they possibly can. And then they had the big bonus with Saudi Arabia. Man, and those TV deals to Fox, USA, and then Saudi Arabia, that's what made the company worth billions. And they were just piling money. And like you said, they remember they cut Stephanie's staff. They were cutting staff at the office. It did seem like everything was pointing that direction. That seems like it's Nick Khan's MO. You know what I mean? They, you know, clean things up and let's get ready to sell. Yeah, I saw something a couple of months ago where Khan actually grew up by The Rock. Did you know that? Yes, they were uh, childhood friends, actually, which is surprising and shocking. So it's almost like, wait a second, now the guy's CEO, what is the Rock going to get somebody together and put you know money into it? He's going to buy it? He already did that with the XFL. Yeah, and that's where I was going with the XFL. I'm sure that he, I'm not sure, but I'm assuming that Khan went to the Rock and said, this is a good deal for both of you. And uh, maybe we can launch this into a real valuable piece of property on streaming service because I saw where the Canadian Football League is going to work with them, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. So, I mean, uh, you give a, uh, an outlet to the Canadian Football League, which is pretty cool, I think. You know what I mean? Yeah, and supposedly so, they might do something with the I, NFL, I, I, too. Yeah, and I think that uh, that the NFL is definitely going to go worldwide. In the, at the longest, will take us five years. They're going to be in Mexico City. They'll be in um, uh, Berlin. They'll be in London. Probably Manchester. Maybe uh, Madrid or Barcelona. So, I mean, they have assimilated all what I think they can get out of wrestling. And when they do this sale, there'll be no wondering if they do the right thing or not. They're all going to make a whole lot of money. What is Vince going to do in retirement? Like you said, never took vacations, didn't have hobbies. What is he going to do now? I have no idea, but whatever he does, you know, it's going to be successful. So he's, you know, quote unquote retired. He did it via Twitter. So did you find that a bit strange about he how went, like he went about, he retired via Twitter. Like he put out a yeah, tweet, like I'm retired. Yeah. I thought that was pretty funny. Like you said, he did it by Twitter. You know, there was no big press conference. There was nothing. And, uh, you know, don't count anything out, right? Could you imagine this WWE gets sold and we have a new NWO come in against AEW and it's Vince and the gang? Oh, imagine that. That'd be nuts. Yeah. That would shake yeah. up the business a bit. Oh, it sure would. It sure would. Do you think that there's a possibility, like Terry Funk did a million times, that he could unretire and return once this blows over? Uh, you have to be a very unique person to do what Terry has done. Vince McMahon is more unique than Terry, and that's saying something. Yeah, I think he could. I think he could. Right? Once it blows over, he's still technically the owner of the company. They kind of have to listen to him and kind of do what he wants to do. But, you know, smartly right now, he's kind of going away. But once, let's say, everything blows over, he's not guilty of anything or maybe no improprieties or no sexual misconduct, the money was legal, whatever, the way he went about it. Like, maybe he could return, right? I mean, you never say never. Right. I mean, especially up there, right? I mean, I saw a thing on YouTube that said 40 guys that wouldn't return and 
to the WWE, and they take everybody back. They really do. It's crazy with yep. uh, with Vince, though. I mean, what a crazy turn of events. Yep, it really is crazy. So let's talk a little bit about the subject at hand, Bash of the Beach 2000, which was held on July 9th. Daytona Beach, your favorite place at the Ocean Center down there in Florida. The attendance, 6,572. The tagline, it ain't no picnic. Pay-per-view buys, only 100,000. Where are you at this point in 2000? I know you're not there. Technically, you're getting paid, but where are you? Um, uh, what... What t- time of the year was that? July. This is July 9th, two thousand. Yeah, I I was in uh, Hope Town in the Bahamas, and I was staying there for a long time. <clears throat> I had friends there that had a dive shop, and I went down there. I stayed for about a month. Pretty cool. What were you doing? That hunting, fishing? What were you doing down there? D- diving. They, had, they owned a dive shop, so I would go out with them. <clears throat> we fish, but mostly diving. Beautiful place, Hope Town. Beautiful place. Were you coming <clears> up? They actually had these. Tiny... No, no. I wasn't paying any attention to it then. I mean, you know, <clears throat> you wouldn't come in until late from a dive, and you may go out on a dive. But occasionally, I'd, I'd catch something, but. No, I was enjoying my life. Yeah, sounds like love and life out there uh, for sure. But when yeah. WW is at this point, it's Bischoff and Russo. It's their era. They're together. I mean, there's no way that you thought that these two would last together, right? I thought that if Eric was by himself, absolutely. And there was a, a it ran through my mind that. He, he could have made it, Vinny could have made it on his own, <clears throat> but I didn't think they could mesh those two. Did you? No, definitely not. Did you look back? Did you think? Then I, I didn't think so. Yeah. It was two weird personalities, kind of like the, the northern WWF guy, the guy that was successful in WCW I can't in Bischoff. I can't see them being able to work together. Now looking back, it just seems like insane that Brad Siegel thought, thought it was a good idea. Yeah, I mean, I don't understand. They're both very good salesmen, so they probably sold it that they both could get along together. But I'm like you. I don't understand how Brad Sigel could thought they could get along. And it's like the guys are supposedly even, but Brad Siegel told Bischoff he's in charge, and he told Russo he would have to okay things with Bischoff. So it's like they kind of both think they're in charge to a certain extent, but then Bischoff almost has the ultimate power. But then he's not writing the show. He's just given the, the, the sign-off on it. So it just it just was destined to fail to me. I mean, do you like that? Let's just say you're working with Dusty or something. All right, Dusty, I, I'm going to book the show, but then I have to get everything okay through you at the end. I mean, do you like that idea? No, not really. It's very hard for both of us to have the same thought process. And that's very hard when the North Tower steps in and tries to play referee. It's very, very difficult. Did you have any sort of relationship with Brad Siegel? Not a good one, no. Well, what's up with that? What do you mean? <clears throat> I'm sorry for what he was. Uh, a guy that thought he knew, like most of them in the North Tower, this isn't that he's a bad guy, but they all <clears throat> thought they knew how easy wrestling was. They didn't think it was hard at all. And I mean, Eric had to really go over there and change their minds a bunch of times. And they they were so, I mean, going back to Jim Hurd and the Ding Dongs, he wasn't the only one that was coming up with crazy ideas. You know what I'm saying? Yep. So you yeah. talked to Brad once in a while or not really? Well, I would talk to him. You know, they'd have meetings and I'd have to go to the silly meetings. And, uh, yeah, he, he just thought that this was the easiest thing in the world to do. 
you get a ring, you put lights in, you get two guys, and they turn into you, and they you draw money, you draw ratings. Very difficult. Would he pitch ideas and stuff, or no? That's not his thing. He didn't do it to me. He might have done it to Eric. What did you think of Russo? Like, did you guys get along? Kind of, I guess he comes in, then you come in, then he comes back. I mean, so what do you think about Russo? And did you guys get along? Business, I mean, personally, I got along with him. Business wise, we came from two different schools. Doesn't mean he was right, doesn't mean he was wrong. Same for me, doesn't mean I was right or wrong. We just came from two different thought processes and uh, <clears throat> he had some very good ideas I thought there were some that weren't the same same mentality that what that company was built on did I explain that right what I'm saying is the company was built on big guys big heat big violence with guys that look like wrestlers. Did I explain it better that time? Yeah, where the big boys play, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and uh, he, he, he did a good job, I guess. I mean, I wasn't there when he came in. Uh, I was there when he came in, but I wasn't there after a while. So I guess, you know, I've heard people loved him and people hated him and that's how it usually goes but i mean i also told you about <clears throat> people with butcher dusty for being a world champion i never hear anybody not really for being the world champion do you not as much as they should because that is the worst title win in my mind ever because Arquette at least you're trying to go for and, and obviously Arquette's not booking it either at least you're trying to go for like front cover shock value he's got a Hollywood name his wife is super famous she's on Friends all this other stuff I could kind of see that but Russo there's no like there's no good reasoning behind it and even Dusty the guy's the most over guy in the company yeah he's booking it but he's the most over guy so he could win it yeah and at that period of time with Dusty Dusty was the second most sober guy in the wrestling business. Hogan then Dusty. So, I mean, you know, and, and you got to pass on that. That's, that's pretty cool. How come you never booked yourself to be world champion as far as uh, WCW? I wasn't that caliber to be world champion. I mean... <clears throat> The guys that are world champion, first of all, in my mind, back then at least, should be a gimmick. And I was a gimmick. And uh, there should be a distinct level of reality to be the world champion. I mean, I think that's why uh, Goldberg got over so well. He looked the part. He acted the part. Uh, on the other side, Steve Austin saved their asses. Same reason. I think it has to be somebody. And I don't mean you got to go back into the way, way back in the past and try to have uh, black tights and black boots and Luthez Wrestling Clinic, but you it's like when Cena was champion, he had the aura of being a, a, a class athlete and a world-class wrestler. Did you, did you see that in him, John? Yes, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So when you look at this show, there's so much controversy surrounding it because, and I know maybe people, people didn't realize at the time, but if you're paying attention to the sheets and you're paying attention to certain wrestlers, you know Hogan wants to be world champion. Russo doesn't want Hogan to be world champion. Supposedly behind the scenes, they, they, you know, they're having money problems where they're losing all this amount of money. Do they really want Hogan on, on the shows? He's so expensive. 
I, I don't know about all that because I don't know how the contracts work and I don't know how much time Hogan's supposed to be on TV and on pay-per-view and stuff, but the whole thing is Russo and Bischoff are going to concoct what they think is something to work the, the marks and to work the sheets and have like this thing where Hogan's going to end up winning the title and walking out, and then eventually they're going to bring him back and Hogan cha- as champion is going to face whoever Russo's champion is. There's so much like intrigue and story. Bischoff has one story. Hogan has another story. Russo has his own story. Were you paying attention to any of this that was going on with like basically Russo not wanting Hogan to be champion? No, not at all. Not at all. I was, like I said, I was in the Bahamas for that month of July and I was flying in and out and I was also going to Spain and Europe quite a bit at that time. That was a year I really traveled and dove all over the world. Yeah. Did JJ call you and say like, "Oh man, what a clusterfuck we got going on over here"? Yeah, he would call me and he'd say, "Hey, will you watch it and tell me what you think." And that week, I, if, if I was in the states, I would. Yeah. So we'll just get into it now. As far as that match, we'll run through the card too, of course. But so Hogan has his title match against Chef Jarrett. As a fan, you know, like timing wise on the show, like this can't be the main event. There's two. There's a one match left besides this one. And which eventually is going to turn into two matches, but then then it's like okay, timing wise, what's going on here with the end of this show? So you know something is up. So Bischoff or uh, Bischoff done on TV, but Hogan comes out, Jeff Jarrett comes out, Jarrett, who's the world champion, just lays down, and Hogan puts his foot on him and pins him one two three, and Russo comes out, Hogan gets on the mic, he said, "This is why this place is in the shitter." Stuff like this. Supposedly there's some sort of work shoot element to it going on here where this was trying to like work everybody. So Hogan and Russo were on the same page. After that, Russo comes out, Hogan and Bischoff leave the building with the title. And they actually have a new title, which is the same big old belt, just a different version of it that they'll use later on for the main event. But the whole thing was Russo comes out, cuts a promo, rips Hogan to shreds saying that he's out of here. Uh, you know, just totally ripping Hogan apart, saying that, that the guys in the back want don't want Hogan anymore, and he wanted to be champion and creative control and all this other stuff. Does this sound like something that, that should be a wrestling angle on TV, that they're playing off real-life stuff, and then Russo kind of went into business for himself, so to speak? To me, when I did it with Pillman, it was that he was crazy, and we had a personal vendetta. And we we're going to pay it off by getting him over. This is like a personal vendetta that isn't going to help the wrestling business. But it, you're trying to get yourself noticed by the wrestling universe. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah, I just say there's no payoff. It's like... <clears throat> AEW with MJF and Tony. Well, if they did this angle and he was going to wrestle, the guy that was leading the charge was, was Punk. You know, if, if it's a work or a shoot, it doesn't matter because when he does come back, there's no payoff. He's not going to wrestle Tony, I don't believe. Do you? No, no, definitely not. So I think this is what they did there. They built a, a main event angle and exposed that it really wasn't any different than any other wrestling match. And diluted the company as much as they possibly can. By doing that, and, uh, you know, the young guys versus the old guys. Uh, Viag were in a pole match. You know, I know <laughs> some of the stuff. I mean, it was, yeah. it, was a, it was a shock. Shock TV. Yeah. Crash TV is what, what he refers to it as. But, yes. So, there's a dispute. Hogan wants to be champ. Russo doesn't want him to be champ. Russo's the booker. Bischoff has final say, so he's going to agree with the Hulkster, obviously, his buddy. But the whole thing was Hogan has creative control. Like, So I guess Russo, this was his way of how can we get the title 
on somebody else because he doesn't want Hogan as his champion, but Hogan has the final say on what's going on, so he wants to be champion. Is that, I don't know, is that just, um, I don't know, it's one of the things where it, it's tough to, to work around that, right? Being, if you're a creative, you don't want a guy to be champ, and he has creative control, and he says, well, I want to win, I want to be champ. I think this whole th deal was a complete farce and a work with them. Let's go back to what I've told you before, JP. Hogan has a personal service contract with Ted Turner. He isn't under WCW contract. He's not even under uh, t t Turner wrestling contract. He's on a personal service contract to Ted Turner. How can you go around that when he has complete control, utter control? Are you just bullshitting everybody or are you just trying to think that you can ramrod your ideas through because you, you think they're, and they probably would have, helped if you thought you could get it through and you knew the guy wasn't going to let you. You know, it's like sticking your finger in the dike when it's the water's leaking, don't you think? Yeah. Yep. I mean, <clears throat> I, that's why I think it was a work all the way. If you know the guy's got complete control and it doesn't matter how bad the rating has gone, if they still allow... Can you hear me? Kevin and Bruce said yeah. about uh, Russo and um, Hogan, how it was a bit of a work shoot going on. Yeah, I think they Russo worked himself into a shoot. You know what I mean? 
because he realized he was stuck because Hogan has the power. What do you think? They both have said it was supposed to be a work shoot to the point where Hogan leaves with the title, but he's still technically champion. Then they're going to crown a new champion at the end of the night, and then a few months later they're going to build up and have basically Bischoff's champion, which is Hogan, against Russo's champion, who was either going to be Booker T or maybe Goldberg. So that was the plan, but then Hogan and Bischoff leave the building, and Russo gets on the mic and cuts a scathing promo calling Hogan a piece of shit revealing that he had creative control and that revealing he didn't want him to be world champion and that later on the night it was going to be Booker T versus Jeff Jarrett for the title for the vacant title and whoever won is going to be the his real world champion. Do you think that when Russo was calling Hogan a piece of shit he was working that's the contention because Hulk ends up suing them, and that's the contention. They never agreed on that. It seemed like he was shooting a bit. He says he's working, but it just seemed like it got out of control. It seemed like he was shooting because Hogan was tough to deal with her, I, I guess, to him. Hogan was tough to deal with her, I guess, to him. Yeah. I think that <clears throat> he worked himself into a shoot. And I... <sighs> Look at how fall, fall. Look at how far we're falling from everything runs so smoothly to everything being so crazy. In crazy ideas, basically exposing the business over the world championship, right? Yeah, definitely. Strange to me. It's just one of those shows that kind of lives in infamy. I know it only did 100K buys, but so many people talk about it. And, you know, they're still doing shows about it today, talking about the controversy between Hogan and Russo and how it all kind of went sideways. And sometimes the controversy, like Bishop says, controversy creates cash. It's a good thing. This time, not so much. I mean, it, it didn't do any business. It didn't help them at all. Yeah. And I, I understand that Eric's line, and he's completely right most of the time. But like you said, this didn't help them at all. This will be Hogan's last show, too. I mean, he this doesn't end, end, up, end up coming back, which is crazy, right? I mean, this is Hulk's last show. He doesn't end up coming back after this. Wow. That is crazy. That is crazy. Now, Russo contends that Brad Siegel told him, I let Hogan sit out at home. He's too expensive. We can't afford him. I don't know if that's true because, like you said, with the personal services and, and, and because of the way the contracts work, I don't know. But it looked like Hogan didn't want to come back because of the way he was treated at that show. And, and he ended up suing WCW. So it was one of the things where I think Hogan almost didn't want to come back. Yeah, I think you may be right. And uh, maybe he thought... He was going to go to New York. Do you know what I mean? Yep. Do you think it was possibly in his mind back then? No doubt about it. I feel like that's always where maybe he wanted to go back to. Yeah, I do too. That was home. And obviously there was a ton of money in him because when he came back in 2002, only two years after this, basically, I mean, there, he was the most over guy. I mean, the, and the amount of money and merch and, you know, whether it be the NWO or Hulkamania when it came back, I mean, he made a ton of money in that year for the company. He was kind of, you know, he was the guy, even though he was, you know, well into his 40s at this point. I mean, he was, he was the guy when he came back in 02. Yeah. I mean, and they had, taking that heat from WCW over there. And right away, they didn't have to build a storyline because the guys were pissed at the NWO. Absolutely, yeah. And if you look at it, it's like, okay, the way Russo handled it, you know, probably not great. How would you have handled it? How would you have booked it if this was the case and Hogan didn't want to be, didn't want to lose? And, um, you know, let's say you didn't want him to be the world champion. How do you book it? Well, I don't think you put yourself in that position. If he's got control from the guy 
that owns the world, meaning the media world at the time. You can't put yourself in this position. Or oh, you need to put your personal uh, thoughts aside and understand you have no control of this. You're going to do what he wants to do. So here we'll go over the rest of the card because it's just one of the things where that's just like the major thing. I think that's what everybody remembers from this card, unfortunately, of Hogan walking out. You know what I mean? I, th I think that's like the uh, the only thing people do remember from the show, to be honest. So the show starts out with Lieutenant Loco versus Juventud Guerrero for the Cruiserweight Championship match. Pretty good match. Goes 12 minutes. Juventud loses, and Lieutenant Loco, a.k.a. Chavo Guerrero, gets the win. So good to start it off with a Cruiserweight match. Good match. But what do you think about Chavo Guerrero as Lieutenant Loco, which is a, kind of a, a silly uh, Russo gimmick? Yeah, uh... Chavo is such a great performer, such a great performer that he can make anything work. But do you put a mask on a guy that everybody in the world knows who it is? It's okay if you work at an angle, but the Guerrero name means something, you know, then and now and forever. I don't think... Go ahead. I was going to say, there's a lot of like other things like, okay, he's Chavo, but it's really like they make him the misfits in action with Lieutenant Loco, so he's out there with General Rection, which we've talked about before, uh, Major Guns, Hooventude's out there with the Filthy Animals, Tigress, Ray Jr., Disco, and Conan, and this is for all surrounding for the Cruiserweight title, but it seems like a lot of Gaga surrounding the title and around Chavo not being Chavo, he's Lieutenant Loco. Yeah, I mean, I don't know where they're going with this. Uh, it was uh, it just goes back to was they trying to do a sitcom? Do you think? Very jokey sports entertainment like characters here that they're creating. Yeah, I mean, huge erection, major guns, which was the uh, Tylene Buck playing the character of Major Guns. She actually flashes her like bikini top too at one point. Uh, during the match, you know, really like sexualizing it, which is, you know, which is fine or whatever, but it's just funny. Like that kind of leads to Chavo getting the win. They're using, you know, her quote unquote, her major guns to help him get the win. So very, very Russo horrific sports entertainment esque stuff going on. Yeah, I can see, you know, I, I, I can see Chavo trying to play the role as best as he could. He's a true professional. I mean, the, but that's people have different tastes. Uh, I'm not into that so much. So then, uh, Big Vito is up next versus Norman Smiley and Ralphus in a hardcore match for the WWE Hardcore title. Big Vito ends up winning this one in six minutes. Just simple comedy stuff. Do you like the fact that they make it, you know, have Ralphus out there wrestling? No, I don't like that idea. I think he just belittles the show. I, If you did it once in a while, yeah, I could understand it, but not in the situation he's backed into it or forced into it. Not just going out there and wrestling. What's your take on that? Uh, that's a bit much. I don't mind him, and I loved him with Jericho. I thought it was funny, but obviously he wasn't wrestling. He's just out there being a little bit of a comedy spot or you know, maybe distracting in, in the match. But to have him actually kind of in the match here with Norman Smiley, I don't know, a little, little too cartoony for me, a little too sports entertainment. I know it's a hardcore match, and Norman Smiley is already doing a lot of funny stuff anyway with the hardcore stuff. I don't know, a little too over the top uh, for me on that. Okay. I understand. And uh, you you kind of uh, follow my my thinking too old school, keep it as straight as possible. Not saying that uh, there can't be some guy guy in there. You have to have some, but don't overdo it. Basically, that's what you're saying, right? Yep. Yeah. 
So, <clears throat> not a great start. I mean, the Cruiserweight match was good, but the Hardcore match, a little bit too much comedy here. Now we're going to go into a wedding gown match. Daphne with Crowbar defeats Miss Hancock, who is obviously Stacey Keebler, with David Flair in this one. That match goes about 14, 4 minutes and 14 seconds. Um, not great here. The funny thing is, it's a wedding gown match, so if you strip, you lose. Stacey Keebler starts stripping, which en enables her to lose. So she, quote-unquote, forgot the stipulation to the match. they got to keep the, your pants on. There's a wedding cake out at, at ringside. So, of course, Crowbar, Hancock, Flair, and Daphne all get into a cake fight. Oof, this was not good. This was pretty much, uh, I don't know, straight trash, I guess you could say. Yeah, I mean, you go from Goldberg and Nash just going to finish. You go from Hogan and Sting, Hogan and Flair, to a uh, wedding cake match. Just doesn't make sense to me. Do you like wedding gown matches with the females? No. Do you like the cake involved? Do you like all that nonsense? I, I, yeah, I, I, if if it's a Jimmy Cornette production, Jimmy knows how to do that stuff. But when you start to take a guy like Crowbar, who was starting to get over, and and Vito too, they were starting to get over as being solid. I think it's that puts them back a few steps that you have to correct it. Uh, maybe you push the two far back. I don't know. So the next match we have Chronic. Brian Adams and Brian Clark defeat the perfect event of Sean Stasiak and Chuck Palumbo for the WWE Tag Team titles. Match goes about 13 minutes, 30 seconds. Chronic are your new tag team champs. Not a bad match here. What do you think about Adams and Clark and putting them together? Oh, I like them. Big boys. I like them. I like them a lot. Love them. Love them a lot. Uh, I had been there when they first got together. Now, I would love to see them get a push and uh, something done. I don't remember what their demise was. Do you? Uh, they were there until the dying days of WCW. So they ended up eventually going to the WWF and they had a really bad match against Undertaker and Kane. And that was pretty much the end of them. But they did go to Japan for a bit and were pretty successful. Oh, good. I like both of them. They were very nice. Undertaker and Kane got to take their, their lumps on that one, too. I mean, that match just absolutely stunk all the way around when they had that. But this one wasn't bad, though. The perfect event, obviously, Stasiak and uh, Palumbo. Did you like those guys? They seemed like they had a ton of potential at this point. Oh, I thought they had potential all the way around. Again, I, I'm not – I wasn't – there to really watch what was going on. So, yeah, potential. Yeah, they had all the potential in the world, I thought. They look great. I mean, yeah. So then One the, the next... Son of the former world champion? Right? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, Sean. Yeah. Stand the man. Yeah. So the next matchup, Chris Canyon defeated Booker T in about 10 minutes. Very good match here between those two. Jeff Jarrett came out and cheated to help Canyon get the win. Did you always see something in Canyon? It seemed like you were, uh, you know, a fan of his and uh, was was on his side. Yeah, I, I saw something in him, and I saw when it was him, Page, and uh, Bammer, right? The yep. Trident. Triad. Yep. Yeah, Triad, brother. I thought that was a a very good faction i think they could have got a lot more out of than they did i'm not sure again what happened there but uh yeah he 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 worked very hard chris so it's interesting to note here booker t loses here and like we mentioned he'll be wrestling jeff Jarrett later and i know you're not a big fan of that because we've talked about this before, because they've done this before with the booking. Do you like how a guy will lose earlier on to somebody else and then in the main event end up either winning the title or winning the match? I mean, basically it goes one and one for the show. No, I don't like it. Isn't that what we call uh, 
what do they call that today's world? Uh, 50, 50, 50, 50 book? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I don't really see it. I think it's a bad move. I think, it, it, you know, I don't, I, I mean, maybe it can be convinced otherwise, but I just don't see it. Booking wise, why like why do that? Do you think that makes any sense? Like if you're really trying to build somebody up and they're gonna be the eventual world champion, does that make any sense? Not to me. Does it to you? No, because it seems like, oh wow, the guy already lost. He's not that great of a champion. You know what I mean? It just right. doesn't seem right. like a big build up. I uh, I think this exact same thing. Nobody gotta build. I mean, like you said, if you're gonna win, you gotta win. You know. So. I mean, obviously you're booking, or he was booking the show, so he knows Booker T's coming back out later on, and he's going to win the world title. So it's like, wow, he's going to lose to Canyon before that, who's not necessarily the a main event player either. Right. And I know they're going to say, well, we had uh, Jeff come out, and Jeff and him are going to wrestle for it later. No, nah, that's not the way to do it. You want your baby face standing tall. Then we have Mike Awesome defeating Scott Steiner with the beautiful Medasia by disqualification. This was for the United States Championship, so Scotty Steiner will retain. Match goes about nine minutes. Actually, a pretty good one. I like uh, Mike Awesome. I obviously love loves Scotty Steiner, but a, actually a, a pretty good match here between Steiner and Mike Awesome. Uh, yeah, I was in Japan with Mike Awesome. That's when I met him. He's very nice. He had all kinds of potential. Uh, I'm glad that they had a good match. He was a very good performer. Only thing I don't like about it, Ernest Miller comes out, and that, that's where the, the kind of schmas and the DQ happens, and that's why Mike Awesome gets the win. It's like, okay, they had a good match, but how could they kind of, I don't know, screw it up? They do kind of screw it up because they have Ernest and Cat Miller come out at the end and kind of um, cause the DQ, but it kind of ruins the match. To me, it would have been better just do a straight finish. I, I think the match could have been even better. Well, how many uh, interference have we had so far? Um, almost every match, to be honest, has had some. Almost every match. So, overkill. A little overkill. So that means officials don't mean anything. True, yeah. Well, if we saw that on football... Will we stop turning in? Yeah, true. They got to have some sort of uh, respect for the officials, and not every match needs an interference. Well, well you don't need an official out there if that's what you're going to do. True. <laughs> yeah. Yep. 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 So the next matchup is kind of one of the first really cinematic matches that I can remember. It's a graveyard match. The graveyard looked kind of like a really bad horror movie. It was kind of cheesy. Um, not great, but it's Vampiro defeating the Kiss Demon in about eight minutes. Not a good match here. Just I know you didn't see it, but just the thought, think about it. It's like a cheesy set of, of a show, but it's a fake graveyard, and these guys are going to have like a you know, okay match, not not really a great match in it, but just the ambiance kind of kills it to me. Grand nine from out of space, right? Yeah. Yep. Did you ever see that, John? Yep. Oh yeah, yeah. Horrible. Yep. Worst movie ever made. Yeah. Uh, I would really like to have known the background. What was going on with Dale Torborg at the time? I thought he was a very, very uh, up and coming guy. And they were they getting paid from Kiss to uh, was WCW getting paid from uh, Kiss to push uh, Dale around to give him a push? I don't know for sure. That I've heard that claim by a few people, but I don't know if that's actually true or not. I God, I hope so to be able to do that crappy gimmick, but I don't know. Yeah, yeah, he's a great athlete, great athlete, and his wife, you know, China, Asia rather, was great. Yeah, 
Yep. Yeah. She's out there. She was interfering a bit um, in, in that match as well. But Vampiro gets the win, and not a good one for that one. Then up next, we have Shane Douglas, the franchise, defeating Buff Bagwell in about eight minutes here. Decent match. It was okay. But, of course, Tori Wilson interferes and helps Shane win. Just another kind of interference. But, you know, to me, decent match. Shane and Buff maybe could, could have uh, had a better performance from both of them. I would think they would have had a great match. But when you're repeating the same finish over and over again, who knows, you know? Yep. So then we have the WWE World Heavyweight Championship match that we alluded to and we talked about a bunch earlier. Hollywood Hulk Hogan defeats Jeff Jarrett in about a minute and 19 seconds. But really, Jarrett just laid down. Hogan put his foot on him. He pins him. They give Hogan the belt. Jarrett doesn't even look at Hogan. He rolls out of the ring, walks away. Hogan says to Russo, shit like this is why the company is in as bad a shape as it is. And he's, he's the new champion. And, you know, just he, he leaves the building and he's gone. So Russo basically supposedly convinces Hogan to get the, the cheap victory and that he'll be back at some at some point. Then Hogan would end up suing Russo for a defamation of character after his promo was, you know, insult laden and ripping apart um, the immortal Hulk Hogan. What happened with that lawsuit? Now, now, the contention that I've always heard is that Hogan won um, and Bischoff has said Hogan won. So Russo has said that he didn't win the lawsuit, but according to Hogan and Bischoff, he did. So I don't know. I'm going to have to do some research on that to see who who's right and who's wrong. But Hogan never came back, and supposedly Hogan got money from WCW for it. So to me, it seemed like Hogan won the defamation of character. Well, I mean, that's public record. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, yeah. It would be easy to find that out. He but, did get some money, yeah. so I don't, I don't know if that's a win or if a settle. So it was, I guess, some sort of settlement because he did end up getting some money for it. And if this was a work and they decide to go all the way with it, pretty silly that you have a guy calling his champion a piece of shit and the company ends up paying for it and it was a work. Who's thought process was this right now they're saying hogan was going to leave for a few months and come back so saying he was going to come back a few Ah. months later with his his you know hollywood hogan world heavyweight title and it's either going to be maybe him versus jeff or him versus goldberg him versus booker t but like you said he wasn't supposed to call him a piece of shit and say creative control and that that was the hogan memorial title and the real titles on the line later. That was never agreed upon. Okay. But to me, that seems like a real deluded way to get there, huh? Yep. Wow. Wow. Yeah. N- not really a big fan of that one. It, it, big swing and a big miss all the way around on that one. Yeah, I think you're right. Then we have Goldberg versus Kevin Nash in a singles match. Here's the weird part. It's Scott Hall's contract is on the line in this match. The funny thing is Hall's already gone from WCW at this point, so I don't know why they're kind of teasing it, but I remember as a fan thinking, like, oh, wow, they're going to bring Scott Hall back? No, Scott Steiner comes out for some reason and cheats. Goldberg's a heel at this point, which is even dumber. This is even really, really bad, but Goldberg ends up defeating Nash so the contract with Scott Hall is then terminated. The match goes five minutes and 30 seconds. Um, Goldberg like rips up Hall's contract afterwards, and um, Steiner and Goldberg end up beating up Nash, too. So, I mean, this was weird all the way around, and, and I wonder what Scott Hall was thinking. Like, they're pretending I'm coming back? Like, why? Like, I surprised Nash agreed to be in the match, to be honest. Wow. That's a... Wow. They must, I'm assuming, that Vince had a mastermind planned. And I don't want to just bash somebody not knowing the facts, but they really got themselves in a few corners here. And 
it's very hard when you get yourself into corners like this. It seems that every turn you do, things don't work out, especially the Hogan thing. You end up going getting sued. And, you know, at that time, JP, as I told you, I was diving and stuff. Were people making fun of that, that they were actually suing one another, Jarrett and Hogan? Oh, yeah, it made WCW look like, you know, bumbling fools. Like, wait, how the heck is it a work shoot if Hogan is legitimately really suing them? You know, so it, it didn't look good on the company at all. It looked like, man, looked like a bunch of fools. Yeah, yeah. I could see that. Do you like having fake contract matches for guys that aren't even in the company anymore <laughs> and pretending no, that no. the guy's going to come back? Like, I mean, they were really teasing that whole, oh, Hall could come back. No, I mean, here's the only thing I can think of. Maybe they were trying to get Hall to come back. Maybe they had talks. Maybe Hall had said, yeah, I'll come back if you give me this, this, and this. Who knows? But it seems to me they're in a downward spiral right here and it's very difficult to, to I mean going back to what we said the referees the interference things that made no sense fighting for a guy's contract that isn't even in the company uh, doing a work shoot and get involved in the work shoot itself I mean this was very difficult on them to me it's really like a bait and switch it's like oh Hall could come back and they know full well he's not coming back. Like so, that's a little bit of a tease there. Then they're trying to build up Goldberg as this heel, and that doesn't really work. And Scott Steiner was kind of a babyface earlier against Mike Awesome, and now he comes and he's a heel and he beats up Nash. But why does Steiner care what happens to Hall and Hall's contract? So it, weird all the way around. Like why would Goldberg and Steiner be teaming up together? Just it it doesn't make sense on any, any level. Well. I can't make a decision on this. I'm going with yours. Uh, I seem to lean the your way because I had no idea what was going on at that time. But if you tell me that's where you lay, it, you've laid the program out to me right now, then I have to completely agree with you. And Goldberg is a heel, too. So, I mean, that... Yeah. Weird. I know he had heat with Hall, so that, that part kind of makes sense where he'd want to destroy it but he's the baby you know he's the baby face wcw for a few years he's a face wcw now he's a heel for shock value and it's not really working yeah yeah i don't see it very strange so. stuff they actually too on on a nitro randomly him as a heel they had him lose to booker t almost straight up they had him lose to booker t so it's like they didn't really know what they were doing with goldberg like they just have him lose a weird quickie match to Booker T on a nitro without any sort of like build up and, and not on a pay-per-view really he was not well booked and I don't maybe not well liked by Russo I'm not even sure that's what it seems like that he wasn't liked so, um... so Scott Hudson says like Goldberg versus Nash was originally supposed to be the main event which I guess kind of covers up for the fact that Hogan and Jarrett was where it was in the card, but it was announced that Booker T versus Jeff Jarrett for the quote unquote real WWE World Heavyweight title would be the main event. And Booker T ends up winning the title in a pretty damn good match in about 13 minutes and 40 seconds. So Booker T is your new WCW World Heavyweight champion after that whole mess with Russo and Hogan and Jarrett. Booker T comes out as the champion. What do you think about Booker T as the World Heavyweight champion? Oh, I love Booker as a champion, but this has just brought your world title down to nothing. He lost early in the night. Hogan and uh, the powers of B are arguing. I don't think it did any great thing for the company. I think he deserved it. He's a great champion, but like I mentioned, losing earlier in the night to Canyon, that kind of killed it for me a bit. Yeah, that's what I just said, too. And how many title matches do they have on the card? Three? Yeah, two two world heavyweight title matches. The Hogan match against Jarrett and the Jarrett match against Booker T. So technically two. Two, yeah, okay. So, I mean, so 
three got different. I don't know. I just, I just can't follow it. Very difficult. So Booker T's the champ. I totally think he deserves it. He's great. Just didn't like the booking of it. The match against yep. Jarrett is great. It's a good match. But also, this is Hogan's last show. So Hogan doesn't come back either. <laughs> Very strange. You know what I mean? Like just looking back, like what a strange turn of events for this show. And it kind of lives in infamy. Yeah, sure does. I have no idea what they're trying to do. Just looking at it, like you would probably dislike the show, you give it a thumbs down. Oh yeah. How can you get a thumbs up? Really, nothing, nothing great. I mean, there was a couple of good matches that I enjoyed, and obviously Booker T had two good matches, one against Canyon, one against Jarrett, but just the, the booking of it's weird. There's a lot of interferences. The Scott Hall contract match with Goldberg and Nash doesn't make sense. The Hogan-Russo work shoot angle, which everybody remembers from the show, kind of the only thing they remember from the show, even more so than Booker T won the world title. They remember the Hogan-Russo stuff. That was a flop. That didn't work out. Hogan suit defamation of character. I mean, what a mess. You, you can't kind of get any more quote-unquote WCW than, than this. Uh, I just don't see how you can possibly say, JP, well, they had a couple of good matches when you just destroyed the world title. They did, yeah. That's true. I guess if you think about it, you could have good matches, but that doesn't get you anything. You know what I mean? That and 50 well, cents. Let's get a, get okay. a cup of coffee. Would Tyson have fought twice on a card and got beat the first time? No. Talk about Booker T. You can't just rearrange the universe. If you're booking that, right, you'd want Booker T to look strong heading into the main event. Like, he didn't even look like he should have been number one contender because he lost earlier. I know Jared cheated, but he it just, to me, didn't even seem like he should have been in the match. If you lose, you certainly don't get a title shot. And the way Russo explained it during his promo was like, the guys in the back that never got a shot that deserve a shot, guys like Booker T are going to end up getting the shots, and he puts over the misfits in action, a couple other guys. But it was just thinking, like, well, well you're giving the guy a tell shot. You, you had him lose earlier in the night <laughs> for no reason. Yeah. Yep, I agree with you 100% there. After this all happened, did JJ give you a call afterwards and say, "Yeah, hey, uh, Kevin, we probably need you back here." Like, did any of that happen? What's that? I didn't hear. Did JJ give you a call after the show and say, "Hey, we might need you back here"? Like this show, this you know, place is a mess. Oh, no, he just said to me, uh, "I just he couldn't believe what was going on." You know what I mean? He couldn't believe it was going on. And J.J. is a wonderful human being. He wasn't knocking it. He's saying, I hope it, it turns out well. But it, 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 by this time, we had done so. It wasn't just Russo. We had done so many bad mistakes. And we were in a panic mode. And you can't get into panic mode. And it became just sloppy. All right, so let's wrap it up this week. Let's head towards the plugs. Yep. WCW Bash of the Beach, not a good show here in 2000. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Two Man Power Trip. Check out the website, tmptempire.com. You can follow Kevin on Instagram at Taskmaster Talks. Go to Kevin's Pro Wrestling Tea Store, prowrestlingtees.com, and visit the Kevin Sullivan Store. Kevin, what else you got going on? Well, I like to plug... Uh... Uh, Ring Squared Old School, the book. You can get it on Amazon. It's The Sopranos Meets Wrestling. But I'll be back with you as soon as possible, JP. Nice. Great stuff, as always, Kevin. Thank you, everybody, for listening. We'll see you right back here next week for a little Taskmaster Talks with Kevin Sullivan. We'll see you next week.